My name is Brian Gilbert, and uh, I'm a software developer, with a master's degree in computer science. I'm here because I'm concerned about climate change. I try to do the right thing in my own life, and I'm here to ask you to do your part. This sewage project, in my mind, is a climate change issue. We're talking about one and a half billion dollars that we could put into real problems. There have been so many sources of information that I've found that I know you've been hearing. Experts, scientists, engineers. And I just don't understand why you're not listening. Then when you bring out justifications that are not, they're misleading. You lose credibility. Um, this is the first time I've ever been. Um, the mobile hacking point, I'm not sure that's the right option thing. I'll just quickly jump over that. You say that jobs are going to be created. If you wanted to create jobs, there's other projects you could put $1.5 $1 .5 million towards. Then you had an ad that you're going to heat 1,000 homes, but that would roughly cost a $1 million per home. The claim that I get upset about is that it's going to be carbon neutral. It's strange. We're going to take something that's going into the ocean, we're going to treat it, we're going to pump it, we're going to dry it, and we're going to ship it, and then you're going to burn it. Now, how can that be carbon neutral? There's CO2 at every stage. So, I think what you're doing is playing a shell game with this carbon neutral and carbon credits. And I ask that you stop doing that. Another claim is it's going to remove toxins. Science studies on your own website, Primer on Wastewater, points out that treatment does not destroy these toxins. All you're going to do is move them from one place to another place. Royal Roads University study, 2010, says the same thing about pharmaceuticals and personal care products. You don't remove them from the water. You don't remove them from the toxin you spread over the land, what you do with it afterwards. But Victorians are conscientious. We look to our leaders for guidance and aid us. And Capital Region District is doing fantastic things. 2010, we collected 8,000 kilograms of medications. These are from your own documentation on your website. Very minor cost, great impact on the environment. And we're doing great things with source control. Mercury discharge, 98% reduction. 
96% of businesses are on clean water programs. 100% of the samples that you've taken show that we meet the BC standards for metals in our discharges. Your documentation. So I ask you to treat science with respect. And I've noticed I haven't found any justification scientific for one and a half million dollar project. This is a climate change issue. And I think you can delay this project. You can delay it on the basis of the low risk. You can fight the bureaucracy. You can just use science to argue against it. You can change it at a political level. This is obviously a political issue, federally, provincially, and municipally. Another approach based on science is use the science to argue that the whole regulations federally just don't make sense. They're not a marine science uh, base. They're for fresh water. There's so many potential legal arguments there. Another point you could do, and it's a shell game, I'll admit it. But you're saying we see the 70 point threshold. That's measured at the pipe, which isn't reasonable compared to past, past practices. So I just propose you could just change the pipe, put in some more water, and dilute it. Based on science, you can do the right thing. You can delay this project. This is a climate change issue. There are so many climate change issues that we need to put this money to. Uh, storm sewers, runoff, transportation. The cities are looking for cash from the federal government from all sources to, to support and fix infrastructure. I also was doing some research and I noticed that our sister city, south of us, 11,000 kilometers, I guess, has a secondary treatment plant. I don't know much about it, but it was $13 million. And I can't see the justification for us spending one and a half billion when a similar city our sister city could do it for so much less. So please, base your decisions on peer-reviewed scientific evidence. Stop the misleading justifications. Thank you. And argue for a delay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Braden Gibson, and I've been a taxpayer in Victoria for 35 years. I would like to state <coughs> that from all I've seen and heard, the original decision to build a land-based sewage treatment plant for Victoria was, one, made in haste, two, based on incomplete information and faulty logic, and three, driven by political correctness rather than scientific fact. And ever since, in order to justify that decision, this committee has consistently ignored the statements of many of the finest minds in our medical, scholastic, and scientific communities. People who, because they understand the science and see the absolute folly of this project, cannot help themselves from speaking out against it. And yet, in the face of their unassailable logic, you have hidden behind the veiled and absurd threat of prosecution by the federal government if you don't comply with their simplistic new one size fits all sewage regulation, which is nothing more than a lazy bureaucratic convenience, just like the National Building Code that bankrupted so many condo owners. Dr. Jack Littlepage has repeatedly spoken about this project. He is Professor Emeritus of Oceanography at the University of Victoria, a man who has devoted his life to the study of our marine environment. Dr. Littlepage has said, and I quote, Breaker Victoria already has the finest and most effective sewage treatment in North America. What other system can you point to which has no appreciable residue, no air or water pollution, requires a minimum shoreline, increases marine productivity, and places a minimum burden on the taxpayer? Then there is Dr. Sean Peck, our former medical health officer, who has spoken out against this project as much because of its total lack of public health benefits as its many other shortcomings. Dr. Peck is a man of science, of logic, and compassion. Week after week, after month after year, Dr. Peck has stood before you, pleading with you to listen to the facts about this project. And yet you sit there, and you nod, and you smile, and then you completely ignore his and all the other experts' critical advice about this misguided venture. Your stubborn refusal to listen to our own best scientific advisors, your aloof attitude towards anyone who dares question your actions <coughs> or point out inconvenient truths is deplorable and unworthy of your office. 
But enough about science and facts. Let's talk for a minute about your job as elected officials. We, the taxpayers, elect you to look after our best interests. It is your responsibility and your duty to be cautious and prudent in fiscal matters, especially when you're trying to saddle us with a truly crippling debt load for no good reason. A debt that will doubtless be made worse by the massive cost overruns which are inevitable for a project of this size and which we alone will bear. Look at a few recent examples. The fast ferries, 120% overrun. The Vancouver Convention Center, 78% overrun. BC Place Revitalization, 55% overrun. Portman Bridge and Highway, 121% overrun. Quite frankly, if we get away with only $1,000 per household and increase taxes every year as a result of this fiasco, it will be nothing short of a miracle. I also have to wonder if you have ever really asked yourselves what motivates those people other than yourselves who endorse this project despite all the evidence to the contrary. The bottom line is this project is nothing but a huge gravy train of long time and lifelong jobs paid for by us, the taxpayers. <coughs> No wonder everybody wants a piece of the action, from big business which designs and will oversee construction, to big labor which will build and operate it, to big government bureaucracy which will manage it. Why wouldn't they all support it? Today, Councillor Derman has offered you a face-saving way to put the brakes on this runaway train. You don't have to kill it. You don't have to say you won't ever do it. You don't even have to say you've changed your mind. Just tell the truth. Just say that in view of the enormous and uncertain costs involved, the conflicting scientific reports about the net benefits of this plan to the environment, and the current enormous worldwide economic uncertainty, you owe it to the taxpayers, to us, to put a temporary hold on this while you reevaluate its merits. It's as simple as that. Thank you.
one of the very few people in the CRD who aren't talking about it right during the federal election. So we respectfully ask those members to reconsider that choice. If the decision to proceed with the proposed treatment facility is not being made under duress and is in fact the environmentally correct one, then it should be both easy and appropriate to explain that to the public at least one more time. Thank you for your time. Hi everyone, my name is Christiane Wilhelmsen, I'm the Executive Director of the Georgia Strait Alliance, and I represent thousands of people throughout the Georgia Basin who are concerned about the health of the Strait of Georgia. I um, also um, have over 10 years of experience in sewage uh, planning throughout the region. I'm including sitting on the Technical and Community Advisory uh, Committee here in the CRD, as well as similar advisory committees in the Regional District of Nanaimo and Metro Vancouver. I also sat on the Advisory Committee for the Development of National Wastewater Strategy and Regulations, and currently sit on the Advisory Committee for the Upgrade of the Lionsgate Treatment Plant in Metro Vancouver. So I have a great deal of experience about wastewater treatment, and I'd like to share some of my perspectives with you. So there is a tradition in this region uh, around treating um, the outfall of the bite as some place that we put our waste, some place that we dump things that we don't want to take responsibility for. But one thing I want to make clear today is that today we do dump, and I use that word on purpose, we do discharge 150 million liters of raw, toxic sewage into the brain environment every single day. It is toxic. By anyone's definition, it is not just food, which some people like to say, it is filled with a larger and increasing amount of toxic chemicals that we are asking our marine environment to deal with because we don't want to. Now, just a quick history of where we've come from. Obviously, there's been a lot of debate about wastewater treatment, and for a long time, the CRD was refusing to do treatment, and the province was supporting that. They approved the liquid waste management plan in 2003 with no plans for treatment. But in 2005, the CRD uh, asked an independent, unbiased group of scientists to look at the liquid waste management plan and let them know if the plan was doing what it was supposed to do. Now, of course, in 2006, what is now known as the CTAC report, as well as the MESL contaminated sites report, were released. These are both scientific reports. And the province used that information to order treatment. We have now spent the last six years talking about treatment, looking at different designs, talking about the best technology. There has been a lot of discussion, community involvement, experts, scientists, engineers talking about this, and we have a plan. The plan may not be perfect, but that plan can get better. The idea of scrapping it and wasting millions of dollars to start over again is irresponsible financially and irresponsible environmentally. We now have the money in place to build the plant. We also have laws in the, both the province and the federal government was mandated. Keep in mind that secondary treatment is not just designed for Victoria. The United Nations, the European Union, the United States all acknowledge sewage is pollution, it must be managed responsibly, and secondary treatment is a minimum standard to get there. So now we have all the pieces in place and it truly is time to move forward. And I must acknowledge there is the opportunity to make this plan better and better. I do want to reinforce that. This is not an all or nothing sum game. So I do want to talk about the two reports that brought about the decision by the province to order treatment. You'll see this is a list of people who hold PhDs. These are all scientists. They're independent, they had no axe to grind, and they were asked to look at the liquid waste management plan. And this is what they said. Adequate control of toxins via source control is unlikely. What that means is you will never deal with all the toxins in sewage just by source control. So the idea that that is the only way to manage it is, is false. The relying on dilution is not a long-term answer. The idea that you could call dumping sewage into the environment sewage treatment is irresponsible and reprehensible in my view. No wastewater manager or his or her salt would acknowledge that. There is a, a term for dumping effluent into the ocean. It is called pollution. It, there's no other definition for it. The marine environment was not designed to take our waste and deal with it. It's up to us to take responsibility. 
Um, the CTAC report also acknowledged that scientific risk concerns argue for treatment. Um, improvements to wastewater handling and the CRD will result in significant reductions in risk to human health and the biologically rich marine environment. These are scientists who have said this. There are scientists who disagree, but the idea that all scientists don't support CRD is simply wrong. There's also a fallacy out there that the marine environment is perfectly fine and not being impacted by sewage treatment. This is not true. The Contaminated Sites Report in 2006 said the seabed is sufficiently contaminated to warrant designation under the Contaminated Sites Regulation. Where does that contamination come from? I've heard many theories. But the most obvious answer um, is the sewage itself, and in fact, that's where it's coming from. And here's the other point that that report made. Source control and wastewater treatment rather than active remediation will provide cost-effective means to achieve sediment quality objectives. The idea that sewage is benign is false. I hear a lot of scientists say it's just poo, it's not. It's increasingly filled with toxic chemicals. The other fallacy you're being told repeatedly is secondary treatment is worse than dumping it into the ocean. Listen to that statement. Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that they were. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think you need to educate us as to why it's taking place and exactly what it's going to mean to us, not just financially, how it is going to disturb the kind of environment we live in. And you've got to represent the public to the, to the, the feds and the province. So I encourage you, and I have a, an association with Open Victoria. Uh, I had a very close association with them a while back, and I still have a, a loose association. I think what they're doing is admirable, trying to bring the parties together so that the public can hear both sides of the argument. And I understand, you know, during a federal election, or for that matter, a provincial election, generally, it should be hands off. You should be keeping your way, your, yourself out of the, the, the fire. But this issue is too significant right now. And I encourage you, please, help us understand the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Bill. Yeah. Richard Allen. Yeah. 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 Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again. Uh, speaking to agenda item eight first. Uh, firstly, as I mentioned at your last meeting, where is the minister's letter stating that having a CRD commission is a condition of funding, which it seems to be in the staff report? I was not able to find that. It says in the staff report that it is a condition of funding, but where is the documentation of it? Before you pass this bylaw, should you not have a legal agreement for funding? As was stated in the July 12th announcement, federal funding is conditional on Treasury Board approval and the signing of the contribution agreements. Should you not also see a budget for the Commission? How much an hour a day or a day are you going to pay the Commissioners? I'm very nervous about you getting, uh, sorry, about you creating this albeit CRD Commission without understanding the financial risk of doing so. Speaking to Agenda Item 7, Director Derman's uh, motion, I urge you to support the following part of the motion. Based on extensive scientific and health assessments that indicate minimal harm and risk, lobby the federal government at both the staff and political level to categorize current sewage practice in the core area as low risk. Such a categorization would require compliance with the new federal municipal sewage regulation by 2040. Here are the reasons for supporting this. I take issue with some of the comments in the letter from a staff member at Environment Canada, Mr. James Arnott. Mr. Arnott has given the technical interpretation of this new regulation. I should point out that the legal wording of the regulation does not require secondary treatment. So nowhere in the regulation is secondary treatment mentioned. It requires meeting the TSS, the total suspended solid, and the BOD levels. CRD staff reports have clearly stated that within a number of meters of the end of the diffusers, which are at the end of the deep sea outfalls, these two parameters are met. If the regulation was interpreted to allow an initial dilution zone, as the province of BC has in the past, then the current practice, where the effort is treated naturally by the marine environment, will meet the federal regulation. This is why I urge you to support the government's motion. The actual wording of the regulation is amazing legally when it comes to the pipe. It says, I quote, final discharge point means the point other than an overflow point of a wastewater system beyond which its owner or operator no longer exercises control over the quality of the wastewater before it is deposited as effluent in water or a place. How should this be interpreted? The engineer deep sea outfalls with their diffusers were well designed to and do maintain a great deal of control over the wastewater. This is worth challenging for our waters of Victoria. Today's staff report refers to less use of the ocean oxygen as a result for the land-based treatment. Oxygenation of the waters of Victoria is high, and so there is no benefit in avoiding this naturally occurring environment that digests the biological component of the liquid waste, the rest of water, as stated in the staff report. I am certain that the CRD staff can provide you with all the information needed to provide a challenge to the federal regulation. In 2010, CRD staff, knowing so well the unique receiving environment of Victoria, made a submission in response to the draft federal regulation, in which it was stated as follows. We encourage the federal government to consider an environmental risk assessment approach to regulating wastewater discharges rather than the single set of proposed standards for all receiving environments. In many marine receiving environments, the application of the proposed national performance standard is unlikely to result in any measurable environmental improvement. <coughs> Alternatively, we suggest that the federal government could adopt a waiver system similar to the US EPA waivers that support exemptions to secondary treatment standards in less sensitive receiving environments. Unfortunately, the regulators chose to take 
a one-size-fits-all approach and ignore this very sensible submission <coughs> from the CRD staff. The CRD needs to make a political decision to take action to lawyers to obtain a waiver in spite of the letter from Mr. Arnott, who provides a technical interpretation of the regulation. The law needs to be challenged. I hope you can be persuaded to do so. I would, it would be great benefit to the taxpayers and the environment if the CRD can, can, obtains a waiver, as did San Diego and other places. Thank you very much. two issues related to the core area wastewater treatment program. The first issue concerns the order for further treatment. Anyone who reads the CTAC report will not find a recommendation to implement land-based secondary sewage treatment. The order for former Environment Minister Barry Penner ignored the conclusions of this report, which is also full of political opinions that clearly have no place in a report that is made or that is meant to be a scientific review. Further, the CTAC report never received a peer review, which means its actionable value is limited. The McDonald report that Penner relied upon also makes no secondary treatment recommendation. In fact, neither of the full recommendations of these two reports form a basis for the land-based secondary sewage treatment project that the CRD plans to implement. If that weren't enough, the 2012 Federal Wastewater Systems Effluent Regulation also makes no mention of secondary treatment. Only in the executive summary of the regulatory impact analysis statement, which clearly states, this statement is not part of the regulations, is there any mention of the word secondary? And whenever it is mentioned, it is followed by or equivalent. In other words, there is an expectation that the objective of treatment can be met without the specific application of secondary treatment. Now, the second issue. When the aforementioned regulation was proposed in 2010, there was a request for comments, and I'd like to highlight three comments that were raised in one particular submission. On page two of that submission, highlighted in the supporting document I provided to you all, it reads, National Performance Standards. In many marine receiving environments, the application of the proposed national performance standards is unlikely to result in any measurable environmental improvement. Alternatively, we suggest that the federal government could adopt a waiver system similar to the US EPA waivers that support exemptions to secondary treatment standards in less sensitive receiving environments. Now, what is being said here is that $1 billion will be spent for no measurable benefit, so the government should institute an exemption mechanism for the benefit of taxpayers. On page three it reads, financial implications. Without significant new funding resources, wastewater systems owners will likely have to sacrifice funding opportunities for non-wastewater related projects to meet the needs of this regulation. Paraphrased, this implies that there will be no money for LRT or any other major infrastructure projects for the foreseeable future. And lastly, on page five under final discharge points it reads, when it can be demonstrated that an existing discharge under all operating conditions causes no reduction in dissolved oxygen, we believe CBOD should be admitted from the formula. This is often the case for discharges to the marine environment, particularly open marine waters. Now I'm referencing this last point, and I direct it to councillors, environmental groups, and others who are occupied with dead zones and the oxygen depletion of the ocean. The scientists tell us there are no dead zones, and also look at the abundance of life around the outfalls. I'd be more concerned about the estimated 1.6 megatons of CO2 that will be produced during construction in the lifetime operation of this plant that is contributing to the acidification of the ocean. That is a genuine concern. I'm also highlighting the issue of dead zones to demonstrate the flaws of what I call buffet science, where one picks and chooses facts to support a particular conclusion. This is just one example of a multitude that requires that an environmental impact assessment be done because selective adoption of the facts, as Minister Penner did, will assuredly lead us into environmental and financial quagmire. Now, the most interesting aspect of this 2010 submission I just quoted is that it came from Larissa Hutchison, General Manager, CRD, Environmental <coughs> Sustainability. It is clear that she understands, as many of the public do, that this treatment plan is not appropriate for Greater Victoria because it will not return a demonstrable benefit, and therefore an exemption is necessary to the one-size-fits-all standard due to our geography and lack of heavy industry. When your comments to the effect that such an exemption would require a change in the regulations and is unlikely to be considered, I have to ask, did any of the proponents on this committee push the federal government to consider the recommendations of its own general manager of environmental sustainability? I think it can be easily concluded that the two upper levels of government would be unlikely to voluntarily change the rules, so long as nobody objects to them. 
So here we all are today sitting before you, requesting that as our representatives, you support the two motions outlined in the agenda. Because it is not only the sensible thing to do, but long overdue, and we stand upon a precipice. It is my sincere hope that this body takes a stand on behalf of the public it serves, and challenges the regulations which its own staff appears to feel is inadequately serving our needs. Citizens are demanding that all levels of government take a hard look at the facts and not simply cast them aside for political convenience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, Michelle Holden, Tony Rose, and Janet Gray. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. I must confess that I'm critically nervous about speaking towards this today. I have attended arrest meetings and felt so intimidated that I wasn't able to bring myself to, to say anything there. I have a family history of Victoria that goes back over 100 years, and I grew up learning that the beaches were dirty and you don't go clamming off day and never eat bottom feeders. That's a reality that I grew up with. I am not looking forward to passing on to the next generation, my children and grandchildren, the deficit that was left by my grandparents and great-grandparents in care for the environment in this area. I have read reports, science and otherwise, trying to make sense of what people here are saying, trying to strike a balance, trying to be open-minded. I continue to learn. I learned last night that Victoria is one of the few communities, and I say few, like less than 10 communities in continental North America that does not treat its effluent, its discharge, its sewage into its waters. The ones who do have exemptions are very small communities. I do know that I've heard an argument that compares the Victoria waters to the islands the Channel Islands, where there's a population of 62,000 people in a dispersed community, and they have similar conditions, so it's safe for them to discharge their garbage, their sewage, into their environment. I'm shamed to think that we're one of the few communities in continental North America that does not care enough about its environment to look after it. There, are, there is no perfect project. We know that. And there are pollution issues that are more extensive than what we are jumping off to those points. But we can't continue to do it. On October the 8th, I walked along Dallas Road and looked over, as often we do, just into the water. And there were 40, 50 dead coho washed up against the shore. I've heard said that everything washes out past breaks rocks, and only fresh water enters in to that strait out there. Well, where did those dead coho come from? I don't know. What killed them? Probably lack of water. I don't know. But I think there's lots of things that we don't know about what's going on out there. And I think it's about time we just took responsibility for our part of the world and did something to clean it up, not to continue to dump into it. I feel passionate about this. I don't know why. I've spent so much time thinking, reading, trying to make sense. You know what? We have to do something. We have to do something to make our world better for the future. We can't continue to pass it on and pretend that 2040 is going to have a cheaper, better solution to what we're doing now. We don't know that. We don't even know what's going on out there. We have people saying entirely opposite solutions. One is continue to do what we're doing because what we're doing is treatment. It's not treatment. You know what? What they screen out of those pipes at the end at Macaulay and Clover right now, they take out and dump and treat as hazardous waste out at Hartland Landfill. Well, if what they are taking out is hazardous waste, what about the stuff that's bigger than a thumbtack that is going through those screenings? Is that not hazardous? What parts of it are pure, pristine product? I don't know that any can be. I've heard water's a universal solvent, but things don't go away when you put, it, put them in it. Sorry, I deviated totally from my notes. But you know what? That's the way I feel about this. I could go on and on and on, and I could argue every point that has been made. 
But what I'm trying to say to you is, we have responsibility now. We do, because we're the only ones that can do it. And I really charge people who say that the water is fine to go out there and collect the shellfish and make dinner for their families with it. Because I don't think they do it. And there's a good reason why. It's because we're dumping and destroying. So please, I hope you stop. Also, I read this in the paper. Sewage ads asked after complaints. Well, if those same people that put pressure to stop the ads that gave me information from the other side are holding a meeting during an election campaign, and believe me, that by-election date is after their big meetings, I think we need to stop and look again. I'm a professional engineer and I've been involved in a dozen multi-billion dollar projects from start to finish. I'd like to refer to item six on the agenda to clear some doubts as to the technical viability of sewage treatment. Two members have requested a halt and a re-evaluation. I'd like to make some observations in support of this motion. In the first place, there appears to be a, a failure to carry out any rigorous front end engineering design or protocol. Secondly, without that detail of engineering, we've got a very questionable estimate. It should be at this stage what is termed the class three. And finally, we have the crippling regional costs, and I'll return to that later. I'll leave some typical guidelines for what you should do with the engineering and the estimate with the secretary. Also, as you know, the plant life is only 25 years, like your car. And after that time, we need to replace a large part of the infrastructure and equipment a cost of yet many more billions 25 years from now. So what engineering is needed to generate a class three estimate? You should have a complete design document in seven volumes, outlining the process requirements, the flow sheets, the materials of construction, equipment lists and sizes, block plans, shutdown scenarios, utility requirements, the list goes on. According to your staff, you've got none of these. So that brings me to my second concern, the guest list itself, because that's all it is based on which we continue to churn out reams of paper saying how much the taxpayer will have to pay as if it were gospel. Well, it's not. Your own staff have stated that the overall cost, <coughs> the overall cost is within plus or minus 25%. And that's what you'd expect for a class three estimate. So as the federal and, and provincial contributions are fixed, <laughs> this translates to a potential 66% increase in the CRD portion. That's nearly $200 million more. I think it's important that this is shared with the public. Yet for some reason, it doesn't seem to be common knowledge, nor is it presented in item six as a sensitivity. The estimate should delineate materials, equipment, quantities by discipline, and so on, and give the labor costs associated with each activity. Where is that information? Let me pose a simple fundamental question to the committee. What labor rate in dollars per hour did you use in the estimate? If you can't answer that within the next five minutes, you can be assured that the estimate is not correct. I would strongly suggest at this point that you offer a more reasoned and staged approach with a series of smaller and modular units and a staggered investment over the next 20 years. Test the technology first with a pilot plant. This should appease all the parties. This truly is your window of opportunity and your chance to exercise due diligence. This brings me to my third reason to put hold on the project, and that's the CRD, the Capital Regional Debt. <laughs> For now, we'll assume the project estimates within 25% the CRD contains. So that adds 185 million to the 218 we've already got. That takes the CRD portion to 465 million. Then there's the hidden cost of borrowing a billion dollars. That's at least another 70 million. Add in the Blue Bridge and the current CRD debt, which stands at 350 million dollars, 
and you end up with a total Greek debt of a billion dollars. That's $10,000 per household. How do you reconcile that with a $300, year, $300 a year sewer tax? $10,000 per household, you're asking people. Are those numbers clear to the members of the committee? Is anybody a bit confused by that? Good, I'm glad you all appreciate the numbers, that's fine. So take your time to digest the information, and then you can decide if we're going to afford to proceed with this project, with its debatable science, its limited end engineering, and its dodgy economics. Finally, I should like it on record that I wish to have this presentation appended verbatim to the minutes. And just finally, I've asked Ms. Blackwell for a look at the engineering and the estimate, and I'm still waiting for, I'm still waiting for a reply. The Freedom of Information Act is quite clear. You must not refuse to disclose a technical study or a cost estimate. So I expect that information from you pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Janet Gray and David Anderson and Joe McCarthy. Greetings, Madam Chair Blackwell and directors of the Core Liquid Waste Committee. My name is Janet Gray and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Greater Victoria Water Watch Coalition. We have spoken at numerous meetings of this committee over the years and have been present at many more. Thank you for the opportunity to present <coughs> once again today. For a renowned, beautiful, flower-filled city and capital regional district, sewage seems to be a topic of conversation that is constantly stirring up all kinds of crap, pardon the pun. It was mandated back in 2000, uh, July 2006 by the provincial government that the CRD undertake a process to get sewage treatment. This is after years of previous debate on the subject of whether we should or shouldn't have sewage treatment. We in the coalition were not pleased with the manner in which this was mandated. However, we worked in the CRD area to educate and inform citizens about the problems with public-private partnerships and the need to keep water and sewage treatment ownership and management in public hands. After years of taking, talking to individuals at markets, workshops, film nights, public forums, and GBWWC sponsored events on water, we presented in February 2010 to the CRD a petition with over 4,000 signatures. This petition was specifically focused on asking that the CRD support a public sewage treatment plan and not allow for public-private partnerships. We felt like you heard us. And in May 2010, you decided that the CRD would go for an 80% public sewage plan. Although we were disappointed with the option for a 20% P3 option portion, we all know that you, have been, you had been subjected to enormous pressures, both political and financial, to use this sewage treatment platform to land another P3 in our community. After we delivered our 4,000 plus person strong petition, there was a huge hiatus in the decision making timeline. Why? Well, I suppose it's up to conjecture. All the rush, rush, rush and apparent pressure because of much needed provincial and federal funding for the project disappeared, or so it seemed. Then in July 2012, the plan is on again, only now it has all been decided. Media coverage made with a flurry, with federal, provincial, CRD unan unanimity and no surprise, a P3 partner at the announcement table. And there will be a more or less and, and there will be a more or less 35 to 40% portion as a P3 instead of your earlier stated 20% and the public portion down to about 60% from 80%. The Greater Victoria Water Watch Coalition is all about water. Our position is that water is a shared legacy, a public trust, and a collective responsibility, and we declare that access to clean water is a human right. Ownership, management, and operation of water systems should be public. Conservation is vital. Water connects all life. Why do I bother to mention this? Because at this point in the long, drawn-out process that this has been, how can there be so much conflicting information out there? Scientific facts seem to be as flexible as interpretations of biblical scripture. You will need the wisdom of Solomon to sift through the crap, and what we want is clean water. We as a coalition are concerned about the design and build of this sewage treatment plan for the CRD 
and very interested and concerned about the plan for a P3 portion. We understand that the P3 portion for resource recovery would be built with public funds but operated privately. Are any of the funds building this P3 portion privately financed? We, the public, want transparency and accountability. We understand the terms of the contract for the P3 portion would be 25 years. That's a very long time for public infrastructure. As with other P3 projects, that means that a private company is benefiting financially from the public funding, and when things start to deteriorate, we either get it back or have to infuse more money into it. If we must do a P3, why not insist on a shorter five-year term? Get it going and operate it publicly. This would be a better deal for the taxpayer. This is our one and only ocean, our sewage problem, and our crap, and our resources. Let's benefit from it over the long term, but let's deal with it once and for all and keep management and control of it in public hands. Thank you. Thank you, for, excuse me, thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you today. The preamble to the Federal Wastewater Regulation states that the objective of the secondary wastewater treatment requirement is to reduce the risks of the ecosystem and human health. And there are, there are obviously laudable objectives. However, the issue that we have here is whether on land uh, secondary sewage treatment would in fact achieve those objectives. And the short answer is, they would not, and therefore, they should be challenged. On the health aspect, the best information we have available is that from the six current and former health offices for the region, in whose considered opinion, there are no net health benefits from the proposed treatment. You have their views, and I know they need not repeat them here. On the environmental benefits side, the most informed opinion is from the 10 scientists in the University of Victoria whose views were published in the Marine Pollution Bulletin number 56 in 2008, pages 1815 and following. <coughs> Again, you have their views and you have their analysis, and I need not repeat it here. But their general conclusion is that the adverse environmental effects of the current natural system of wastewater treatment in Greater Victoria region are minor to insignificant. Now, the uh, text of the Canada Gazette that introduced the draft regulations spoke of the United States-Canada cooperation on water quality and suggests that the new regulations would assist in achieving such cooperation. Unfortunately, it was expressed as a hope, a pious hope, with no analysis of the factors involved. And in the geographic area we're talking about, which is basically the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but let us call it the Sailor Sea, in deference to the Georgia Strait people, um, by far the greatest source of contaminants of concern to the marine environment comes from the industrial runoff, the industrial effluence of Seattle, and to a lesser extent Vancouver, but including, of course, some cultivals such as Crawford. The transboundary marine contamination issue was dealt with some years ago in 1994 by a joint Washington-British Columbia marine panel. And the conclusion of the scientists involved in the University of Washington, the University of British Columbia, and the University of Victoria as well as government scientists, was that Victoria's system of discharging wastewater in the tidal flows of the Strait of Juan de Fuca following preliminary treatment did not pose any appreciable risk to the quality of Washington State marine waters. Now, the United States Clean Water Act requirement for secondary treatment has been frequently mentioned in this debate and is mentioned in the text of the Canada Gazette dealing with the Canadian federal regulations. The reference appears to suggest that transboundary environmental cooperation would improve if our uh, legislation resembled that of the United States or was identical to it. And what was not mentioned is the United States Environmental Protection Agency has consistently, over the years, granted waivers for Pacific Coastal City with similar uh, situations Victoria. San Diego has recently had its waiver of the Clean Water Act requirement for secondary treatment confirmed and extended yet again. And there is little question that Victoria would be exempted for similar reasons were the United States Clean Water Act to apply on the Canadian side of the Strait of Juan de Fuca as well as on the American side to the South. 
Thus, the reference to the United States Clean Water Act, rather than being an argument in favor of on-land secondary achievement of Victoria, is in fact an argument against such a provision being applied here. Now, the one-size-fits-all approach for communities below the 54th parallel, by the way, almost half of Canada's land mass is, is excluded from the regulations, the Canadian regulations, regardless of marine or freshwater um, situations, regardless of the success of source control measures, regardless of tidal effects, regardless of current effects, regardless of the oxygenation levels of the receiving water, and regardless of a host of other disparate factors, simply doesn't add up to sensible public policy and does not just to, uh, justify the waste of a billion dollars that could be used for some other desirable uh, pro project with genuine benefits uh, over genuine costs. Uh, my time is expired, but I would like to stress that that is always the case, and we must never forget that a billion dollars taken away and used in this area means a billion dollars less for a host of other worthwhile projects you will be deliberately denying money for other projects if you make the decision to proceed with this uh, money for, for the uh, on-land sewage treatment plant uh, and, and system, which uh, expert opinion says is unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Joe McCarty. $781 million. 
The consultants identified the benefits that could be expected from reduced BOD, bio, uh, biochemical oxygen demand, and reduced TSS. These range from improved biodiversity to improved drinking water. They also identified and measured economic benefits that would flow from surface water quality. These benefits were reduced health risks associated with safer surface water, reduced health risks associated with recreation, such as swimming or fishing, improved recreational opportunities, and significantly improved property values. They also measured the economic benefits from employment associated with the construction and the operation of facilities themselves. The report concluded that the measurable benefits amounted to 1,522 million dollars, which compared very favorably with the 781 million dollars of construction costs. The largest benefit they identified was the expected increase in property values, which amounted to some 600 million dollars. And this is how we got to where we are today. Based on this analysis, the CM CCM concluded that a Canada-wide strategy for the management of municipal waste effluent was economically beneficial, benefit, beneficial and should be adopted. The CCME recommended a set of standards that should be met by all municipalities across Canada, and this became the regulations which Victoria now feel, feels obliged to meet. This one-size-fits-all edict that the CRD feels it must comply with was based on an economic cost-benefit analysis of upgrading 228 communities in New Brunswick and Newfoundland. But none of the benefits that could be identified for New Brunswick and Newfoundland either apply or have any meaning here in Victoria, except for the jobs and the spin-offs from the actual construction project itself. Let me repeat the benefits that they identified and then think whether they apply here in Victoria. Reduced health risks associated with safer surface water. There are no health risks associated with our present system. Reduced human health associated with recreation, such as swimming and fishing. I don't notice anybody not swimming in up our waters. Improved recreational opportunities. Improved property values. This amount to $600 million in the, in the Far East. But it will be amount to zero in Victoria. Putting a secondary treatment plan in Victoria is not going to increase the property values of the citizens of Victoria. In summary, the cost-benefit model used by the CCME consultants to justify secondary treatment is in no way applicable to Victoria. There will be no economic benefits, but there will be huge costs. On page 8 of the report, the consultants made a particularly important note, which is very applicable to Victoria. They say, and I quote, in many cases, significant BOD and TSS reductions are already in place, which is the case in Victoria. And the marginal costs of achieving the proposed standard are very high, that's the case here, and are not highly valued by households, I'm sure that's the case. In such cases, the marginal damage to the environment of existing treatment systems should be assessed to see if, in fact, they are not cost-effective. This is the case in Victoria. Our present system works well. The costs of achieving perceived high standard of a uh, high standard of treatment are very high. There will be no economic benefits, and the household benefits will proceed. No better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for the slide. Next speaker is Donald Ike, and Bob Kerber, and Susan
and Dr. Allen. Most of my work in the Canadian Forces involved introducing sound programs and practices associated at with acceptable health and industrial health status for Eastern and Central Canada. My appointments and duties were associated with the inspections and surveys exist on existing conditions, excuse me, at various heavily industrialized comple complexes and the application of sound industrial health programs and their standards, followed by recommendations by me for consideration to commanding officers on many various units. On several occasions, at the direct instruction of the Surgeon General, I was required to give assistance to municipal authorities in their dealings with emergency health programs and with their expect suspected contamination of public water systems and service disposal. On sure and on two occasions, the existing disposal of wastewater into local waters. I feel that I can claim at least some knowledge of the complexities and problems associated with the collection, treatment and disposal of potable water. And wastewater. I can assure the committee that there are some cities and many smaller communities located near or adjacent to coastal waters in all maritime provinces which dispose of their wastewater by using the tremendous power of the oceans and as a, as a result of tidal action and currents. An example of the successful method of sewage disposal is indeed in existence in the capital region of this state. It's the medium-sized plant established currently on the Saanich Peninsula, which after adequate treatment of the wastewater obviously meets all federal standards and is being disposed of in Harrow Straits. We are blessed with the rugged waters surrounding the southern tip of Vancouver Island, and especially those around the western shores. Known for its vigorous and forcible tidal action and currents, all plants demand, uh, uh, sorry, all plants demand that we give careful consideration for the utilization of such an opportunity, the expense of our potential flowers with wastewater. It is my opinion that the scope of such a large project the adequate disposal of wastewater under consideration must first undergo a thorough evaluation of the existing system to be conducted by scientists, health engineers, marine engineers, construction engineers, and even possibly involving department of fisheries and oceans officials to adequately determine the level of detectable pollutants which are currently present in our existing system. Thereby, their findings and recommendations could then be reviewed by the Western Water Committee for further action. I respectfully suggest it is inconceivable that members of this committee are expected to give their blessings and final approval of the proposed mega project without having a substantiation being received from the information professional bodies. It also of note that several former medical health officers employed by the Capital Regional District and also including the Honorable David Anderson, former Federal Minister of the Environment, have all repeatedly publicly voiced their objections to the, to the proposed wastewater plan. Environmental inspectors employed by the Capital Regional District repeatedly collect hundreds of samples of drinking water throughout the district for an array of evidence of pollution or for, pu for public health purposes. There were occasions when municipal water supplies were taken by the local health department due to public complaints of taste and discoloration. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, may I just say this, last night, no, sir, the Federal Minister of Finance...
time is up, 20, sir. 27, you've got 27 speakers on the list. Chair and Directors, my name is Bob Ferber. I'm a resident of Sandwich. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to speak. In relation to Agenda Item 7, I want to address the new federal wastewater regulations. This is because a number of CRD directors still use the new federal regulations as a reason for forcing the secondary sewage treatment on the CRD. I realize it may take some, some courage to stand your ground regarding the federal regu regulations. But the bottom line is the regulations are flawed. And there is nothing to stop the CID and the provincial governments from challenging them and being successful. The objective of the federal wastewater systems effluent regulations is stated as, I quote, to reduce the threat to fish, fish habitat, and human health from fish consumption. So. We have been complying with the objectives of these regulations for decades. After decades of monitoring and study after study, there is absolutely no evidence anywhere that Victoria's sewage discharges have posed any threat to fish, fish habitat, and human health from fish consumption. Has any director seen evidence to the contrary? If so, please share it. I don't, I don't have the floor, but I have. Okay, after that you can share it. If the eyes of the federal, in the eyes of the federal regulations, the CRD is not failing to meet the objectives of the regulation, it is only failing to follow the one-size-fits-all process prescribed by the regulations. That or thou shalt use secondary treatment. The CRD currently meets these objectives due to Victoria's unique geography ocean environment, and laudable source management. But these are factors not yet recognized by federal lawmakers. Victoria's uniqueness puts the federal government in an unanticipated position where there is a disconnect between the objectives of the regulations, which we currently need, and the prescription in the regulations, which we do not need. So I must ask, what is preventing you as CRD directors from challenging the one-size-fits-all prescription in the federal regulations and do what is right for the environment by saying no to a project that will offer minimal to undetectable ecological benefits, and worse, that will drain funding away from ecologically worthy projects for generations. You can, see, you can seek to have the current sewage practices in the core area recategorized as low risk as proposed by Director Danman and use the grace period to persuade the feds to address the disconnect between the objectives of their regulations and their one size fits all prescription. Alternately, you can say no to these regulations. What are the feds going to do given that their objectives are already being met? Thank you. Next speaker is Susan Lowe, and then Lady Mae Kelly, who's last name should be provided. Uh, Madam Chairperson, respected members of the committee, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the motions in item 7. I have grown up in Victoria, and I am the daughter of a wastewater treatment design engineer. So sewage treatment has been a topic of dinner table conversation since the time I was a consumer of the system. I am also the BC Green Party candidate for Esquimalt Royal Roads in the next May's election. Both federal and provincial Green Parties are very concerned about this topic. And both Elizabeth May and James Dirk have said that we need to rely on evidence-based decision-making not optics, not public opinion. 
As you well understand, the CRD has been pressed into action by an order from the Ministry of Environment, the BC Ministry of Environment, to implement land-based secondary sewage treatment in the core area. Yet, there is no scientific or economic evidence proving that land-based secondary treatment is either necessary or beneficial in Greater Victoria. This should be a giant red flag for you as decision makers. We are at the point where we may commit to spend $782 million, to use your numbers, on an infrastructure project without a scrap of benefit-cost analysis. This is making my father very upset. Unfortunately, his health does not allow him to participate, but he's taught me well. There have been no studies which indicate the economic impacts on, of public op opinion on tourism, just as there are no studies which examine the greenhouse gas emissions of the proposed conveyance system or land-based secondary treatment. And those are not trivial, I assure you. The net environmental impacts of the resource recovery plant have not been tested against practical research models. And none of this plan has been measured against the status quo for whether the proposed plan is an improvement over our existing marine treatment process. Should we allow public opinion or ill-informed politicians from outside our region to bully the CRD into spending what will amount to more than $1 billion on a scientifically untested proposal? We can win some time to look at this properly by approving the motion from German and also from Desjardins and challenging these federal regulations. But it will not be easy. We need you to think clearly before making this commitment, this commitment on behalf of the voters and taxpayers of today and tomorrow, because my son will be carrying this debt as well. Think heavily on that before you vote today. Trust me, as someone from the BC Green Party, I and my fellow candidates, Jane Sturck and Andrew Weaver, have been asking a lot of hard questions before opposing this project. You may be surprised to see someone from the Green Party here. I have gone to the science reports, I have read the theses, I have read the rebuttals to the theses, and I have repeatedly challenged my father to explain to me how marine treatment can possibly be better than land-based treatment. He simply points to the engineering, to the science, to the facts. We cannot ignore these things. I have looked at the CTAC report, the marine monitoring reports, and the research put forward by various parties, and there is no conclusive recommendation for land-based secondary sewage treatment. The CTAC report, when read in whole, does not recommend immediate secondary treatment. You can excerpt any way you want from that report, but when you read it in full, as written, it does not indicate immediate secondary treatment. Dilution is not a long-term strategy, but that does not logically support that we leap into a short-term strategy which has no scientific basis. What we need to do is protect our environment and our economy. We need evidence-based decision-making, not decision-based evidence-making. <laughs> Please pass these motions and recommend to the CRD board that we take the process back into our own hands in the CRD where the decision and the impact will live. Thank you. Um, and so today is also a, is educational for me. 
Uh, I'm here representing myself as a concerned citizen who wants to play an active part in this uh, in the community of Victoria. I'm also a member of Arrest, and after today, I think I might like to be a member of the Open Victoria. Um, a lot of the things that have been said, I uh, totally agree with, um, and it seems on balance that um, we are moving into a decision um, which seems to not be making a lot of sense. In other words, there are a lot of reasons why um, it would be useful to stop the process and, um, and get the, um, uh, from the federal government, get the exemption. The exemption, thank you so much. Um, the concerns, everyone, lots of people have just spoken about the amount of money that it will, will cost us and the likelihood that the benefits are minimal. So on balance, it does seem that, there's an, that there is more, um, more reasons why we should at least stay with our, the present system that we have and go a little bit more cautiously into what we're going to do next. <coughs> I think probably that's all that I'd like to say for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, Brian Virtual and John Ferguson and then Madam Chair, I'm uh, Brian Birchall, I'm the President of Bureau. Uh, I'd like to present the committee with some information that uh, I think supports the two motions under agenda item number seven. My observation of this issue is that I think history is repeating itself. This year, the Government of Canada implemented the federal wastewater regulations, which mandated that all communities treat their wastewater to a single nationwide standard. Regulations do not stipulate what method of treatment must be employed to achieve the standard, but the objectives of the regulations state that the standard to be achieved, the standard be achieved by secondary treatment or equivalent. Forty years ago, this year, the U.S. implemented its Federal Water Pollution Control Act, better known as the Clean Water Act. That legislation also mandated a single nationwide standard and that it be achieved by secondary treatment. However, the legislation did not allow for the possibility of treatment methods equivalent to secondary. A multitude of U.S. communities objected to having the expense and disruption of a large infrastructure project forced on them that would provide little or no benefit to the environment or themselves compared to the system they currently use. The intransigence of the Environmental Protection Agency caused the communities to have to resort to the courts to get relief. Judges let evidence, science, and prudent public policy prevail <coughs> against overzealous regulators. And nearly 50 U.S. coastal communities were granted waivers from the federal regulations. There were so many cases that the U.S. Congress commissioned the National Research Council to review the regulations. The NRC report amounted to a review of the single nationwide standard and made recommendations which led to the acknowledgement that the treatment capability of some coastal waters was equivalent to secondary treatment. Yet here we are 40 years later, and citizens are still needing to battle bureaucrats and politicians unwilling to accept that there are many regions of ocean which treat effluent as effectively as land-based secondary treatment. This committee will hear motion today intended to suspend the CRD's backward plan to replace our existing system system of natural marine treatment of our wastewater with a land-based treatment system. Yes, Victoria's current system does treat our wastewater. Marine treatment is a bona fide method of treatment you can find referred to in wastewater engineering texts. Where the ocean is well mixed and rich in oxygen and microbes, it can replicate the digester and aeration ponds of land-based secondary systems. The Strait of Juan de Fuca is one such region of ocean. 
As to how well it can replicate, I quote from a 1987 Water Research Laboratory publication. There is sound scientific evidence that well-designed, sensibly located, and efficiently operated sea elk falls allow the sewage effluent to be subjected to the same processes of degradation and oxidation that occur in land-based sewage treatment plants, unquote. The treatment capability of the strait is so effective that our current system reduces total suspended solids and biochemical oxygen demand to the regulation levels within less than 25 meters of the alcohol pipes. And the energy to drive the processes is free, sustainable, and reliable. It's the energy of the tides. As for support for the motions and support for keeping Victoria's current system of natural marine treatment, I close by quoting the finding of the U.S. Congress regarding equivalence. The evidence is overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is John Parkinson, and Clown is going to present the motion. Good morning. My name is John Farquharson, and I'm a Victoria resident. Directors, please do the right thing for Victoria, or with respect, step aside. Let me explain. A few weeks ago, I accompanied a colleague to a meeting with a member of this committee and a senior member of the Wastewater Treatment Program. My colleague had asked for some help in making sense of why the board was going forward on this project. He had read and thought a lot about it, but still couldn't understand why the board would not call a halt until a full environmental assessment and cost-benefit analysis had been conducted. The first reason given by the committee member, and later repeated, was that the CRD had been ordered by the federal government to comply with its regulations. If the CRD fought back, directors could be fined up to $300,000 and go to jail. The other major reason provided was that provincial and federal funding was guaranteed. But if there was any delay, the money would be permanently withdrawn. Then the CRD would have to do the project anyway, but at its own expense. I listened and I thought, boy, I sure wouldn't want to be in this or any other CRD director's shoes, being threatened with a stick of fines and jail time and enticed with the carrot of federal funding. But later I thought, you know, I particularly wouldn't want to be in their shoes if I supported the project because of these threats and cajoling, not because I believed it was the best way forward because of the scientific evidence, the environmental impact, and the cost-benefit ratio. That's why I salute the courage of CRD directors Dern and Desjardins. They are, not, they are not convinced, yet despite being subject to the same threats, the same cajoling, they are saying, hold on, wait a minute, we should not be doing this. So I call upon committee members to reflect for a moment. If your first and primary response to why you support this project is, like the committee member I met with, the liability of fines in jail, rather than a clear and compelling presentation of the merits of the project, then maybe you should step aside as a director. You would no longer be liable and probably sleep a lot better at night. Alternatively, if your primary rationale is because of the carrot of millions of dollars of federal and provincial funding, I ask you to think about the source of this money. Much of it is the hard-earned tax dollars of British Columbians outside the CRD and, Cana and Canadians from across the country. I don't think you have the right to take their tax money for a plan that you are not convinced is the best thing to do based on the merits of the project. Why should British Columbians outside the CRD and Canadians outside BC subsidize your, unwilling <coughs> your unwillingness to demonstrate the same tenacity, the same resolve as directors German and uh, Desjardins? Directors, I ask that unless you are thoroughly convinced that this project is the right thing to do, then support their motions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank 
thank you for this opportunity to speak. My hope is that you will not go down as the councillors who organised the largest waste of taxpayer dollars in the history of Victoria. A thousand million dollars is a lot of wasted money and it will in fact make the ocean and our own environment worse. It is a plan based on optics and politics and completely ignores the science. In fact, your own chairperson put it beautifully in 2007 in a quote from the Oak Bay News of 12th December of that year. Ms. Blackwell said, quote, it is basically a political decision. People probably got tired of having to deal with Mr. Floaty, unquote. And for those who believe the CTAP report of 2006 advised secondary treatment, please read the report carefully. It stated that, quote, with our excellent natural treatment already in place, there is no reason to believe that human health risks or ecological consequences will arise in the future, unquote. An issue of the Marine Pollution Bulletin in 2008 carried an editorial by eight scientists based here at UVic, Sydney Ocean Sciences Institute and the UBC. Its title was Sewage Treatment Wasted, the Victoria Example. It stated, quote, the concept of natural sewage treatment is well recognized. It makes no sense to replace a natural system with a human creation that has harmful environmental consequences, unquote. I prefer to believe any scientist whose job is to protect our oceans instead of believing what one MLA said to me on this matter. She said, quote, sometimes in politics, the optics wins out over the science. You just have to accept that, unquote. This seems to me a perversion of the role of a politician. And forgetting the huge waste of money, the two big factors which are threatening our fish are ocean warming and increased acidity. Both are attributable to global warming and increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This CO2 dissolves in water to form carbonic acid, as you know. The proposed sewage treatment will increase our carbon footprint in a very big way. The thousands of tons of concrete used will produce tons and tons of CO2. The heavy duty vehicles will contribute more CO2 and waste more energy. And the 18 kilometer pipeline and pumping stations to push tons of sewage uphill to Halton Road dump will be a perpetual insult to the environment. On television recently, Councillor Jeff Young said he was well aware of the science, but worried about what our neighbors in Washington State would think. Well, the same TV program showed a map of the daily tidal flows off Victoria's shoreline. It was produced by oceanographers in Seattle and clearly showed that any water from our Victoria outfalls flows straight out into the Pacific and almost never reaches Puget Sound or even Port Angeles. I would ask you to cast aside any excuses, such as we are just obeying orders or the train has already left the station, and do what we expect of our elected officials, and that is to prevent this proposed fiscal and environmental disaster. Thank you for listening. Next is Brittany Hill. I'm running so that we can get this over real quick. Thanks very much. I'll try to make it short as possible. My name is Ray Zimmerman. I'm a director at CDC Green Rope Society, and I'm making this presentation on behalf of CDC. Our interest in the past two decades has been um, watershed protection, parks, um, uh, urban settlements, uh, the compact, and primarily the ecological health of our area. Until recently, sewage treatment appeared to be a reasonable and practical thing to do, which we, with which we generally agreed, with some reservations. What's come to light lately, thanks to arrest and many of the people uh, that are associated with that organization, is somewhat troubling. It's nearly impossible to believe that you're going to spend a billion dollars on a project which has had no cost-benefit analysis, and which has not been evaluated under the BC assessment, environmental assessment. It's unbelievable. A billion dollars. How is that possible? It's hard to get your mind around a billion dollars. So I just uh, figured, well, what would this project be on a provincial basis? It's a spending of 12 to 13 billion dollars provincially. 
I mean, it's an immense project. And the ben benefits are minimal or have not been proven, that's for sure. Um, I hate to uh, quote uh, politicians that I, one of them is here, but it's, I have to do this. Um, that the major politician said, expenditure which has no benefit is the height of irresponsibility. This is a breathtaking failure to carry out political responsibilities. CDC will add its name to the list of organizations and individuals which are against this project. And uh, we hope that some of the monies and efforts will be spent on the primary problem. It's not moving pollutants from the sea to the land, to the air, whether you burn it, shuffle it here or there. It's getting it, getting rid of the pollutants initially. So it would be wonderful if you took some of this $1 billion and used it to try to influence the industrial process which uses so many pollutants. Thanks very much. Thank I hope there was less than three minutes. Thank you for this opportunity of speaking to the Core Area Liquid Waste Committee. I address this committee in support of Directors Dermans and Desjardins motions, item seven. I'm a member of a rest and a concerned citizen of planet Earth. A rest is the Association for Responsible and Environmentally Sustainable Sewage Treatment. I'm also a resident of View Royal. I believe that the proposed core area wastewood water treatment project is a bad plan. It will be very harmful, is not needed, and should be stopped. You've already heard this morning all the science and health studies which contribute to a decision regarding this project. Some of it some of it supports the project very little, and most of it is against it. I would like to quote Dr. Jack Littlepage, biological oceanographer emeritus of UVic, who has suggested that instead of flocking like sheep to spend our money, we should all be promoting our present system as the most efficient and environmentally sound system in North America. I refer back to the July 2006 CTAF report, which released scientific evidence that discharge of CRD pre-screened wastewater, sometimes known as sewage, into 60 meter deep, well-mixed marine waters with strong tidal currents resulted in no environmental or human health concerns. The CRD significantly had planned to review that report with public input over the following five months after its release. Contributors to this study included eminent marine scientists from the Universities of Victoria and BC and the Institute of Ocean Sciences in North Saanich. All are our neighbors, all fellow residents. Their report and the CRD's intent, however, was suddenly obviated two days later after the release of the report by the BC Provincial Minister of the Environment directing the CRD to proceed to sewage treatment. I, for one, am left wondering why. Back to the so-named The Path Forward Sewage Treatment Project which promises to lead us into a huge debt of hundreds of millions of tax dollars to pay for extensive construction projects, the construction of which, as we know, will produce huge amounts of CO2, which we also know will be converted to carbonic acid, will increase acidification of the seas, and will thereby inflict far greater harm on marine life than any amount of our current wastewater discharge. Not a good plan. 
It should not happen. Support from this, for this project by the Core Area Liquid Waste Committee indicates to me that by pursuing the project, the committee is not representing the best interests of the core municipalities it represents, their residents or their land, sea, or air environments. Meanwhile, the real threats to our local marine environment are not being addressed. The CTAC review for one, of 2006 also found that the present stormwater, sanitary and combined overflows and other discharges, particularly into the surface waters in Victoria's harbors, create environmental contamination of considerable concern. The city of Victoria, which provides not only for its residents' sanitary needs, but also for the thousands of non-resident commuting city workers and our very welcome visitors, still largely depends upon its original infrastructure of old pipes. I understand also that Uplands in Oak Bay still uses outdated combined discharging of waste and storm water through its storm drains into the sea. Even a fraction of the $500 million which we are considering devoting to the land-based sewage treatment would help greatly in either of these. Is my time up? Your time is up. Okay. I urge members of this committee at this crucial time to take the wisest and most responsible path and support the recommendations of Director Derman and Desjardins. Thank you. Good morning, directors. My name is John Birdbush. I'm an advocate of the environment. I'm an advocate for appropriate, clean, green wastewater treatment. I'm an advocate for the public good. I speak today in support of the motions presented by Directors Dermot and Desjardins. Our system of democratic governance is classically informed by underlying moral values. When major public issues arise, it is essential to return to foundational values to guide our choices. We let those who govern us, <coughs> excuse me, to carry out two fundamentals of democracy. First, to perform the public's bidding using its fiscal resources, and second, to govern for the common good. The common good is that which is in the interest or well-being of the whole community. Fiscal and environmental responsibility is thus a moral issue. How we achieve it, and at whose or what expense, is a moral choice. As I look around the table, I know that all of you directors have been instrumental in the development of making numerous ethical and fiscal choices in the creation of excellent public policy and public projects. A few examples that come easily to mind are affordable housing for the poor and homeless, the outstanding CRD park system, the management of a safe and abundant water supply, extensive municipal and regional trail networks, the CRD recycling program, and a clean, green, an affordable sewage system. And I'm not going to skip to the end. The prerequisite for establishing fiscal and environmental priorities in the nation, the province, and the region is the commitment to an ancient and time-honored idea, the common good. How do we work together to allocate public funds in the most effective manner? How do we treat each other, especially the poorest and most vulnerable? How do we treat the Earth itself, now straining for survival under the impact of pervasive and wasteful resource consumption? Please do the right thing for our region. Listen to the oceanographers and the scientists who advise you that a land-based sewage treatment system is a low, low, low environmental priority. They are powerful advocates for the environment and common sense. Listen to their suggestions of better ways to protect the environment with our precious eco-dollars. Please seek the common good of the region by resisting the provincial and federal levels of government. Tell them that we will not endure the imposition of this massively intrusive project when there is neither scientific rationale nor the democratic will to pursue it. Please support the call for an environmental assessment of the project and the call for a cost-benefit analysis. In short, protect 
our oceans, advocate for the public good. These are the moral choices you are required to make. Thank you. Madam Chair, our members of the committee, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I'm speaking concerning your agenda item number eight. My name is John Motherwell. I'm a professional engineer with over 40 years of experience in municipal sewage collection, treatment, and disposal process. In 1999, my firm won the environmental award of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of the Province of British Columbia in the design, construction, and monitoring category for the sewage treatment plant and outfall for the town of Neal. In Northern Vancouver Island. I'm here to offer my views concerning the current project by the CRD for online treatment of sewage or originating in the core area in place of the current system for discharge to the marine waters by way of two existing outfalls. When one is charged with the responsibility of designing a system for the disposal of domestic sewage to marine waters, one must first find the answer to the question. Will the marine water body accept the discharge without degradation of its public health and environmental aspects? For the current outfalls, the answer is given by the CRD's own annual monitoring reports, which provide no scientific evidence of harm to those aspects, either now or projected. There is no dead zone, no Mr. Floaties from the current screen sewage dis discharge of what is between 99.94 and 99.97% on the CRD's figures of water. In that context, I want to refer to the risks of noise and disruption to residents nearby which the planned project will entail, as seen by someone with experience in construction engineering. My first concern is with the installation of a 1,200 mm pump force main from Cobra Point along Dallas Road through Fairfield, Beacon Hill Park, James Bay, then down a vertical shaft 25 meters deep, then through a tunnel across the harbor 800 meters long, then up another vertical shaft at McLaughlin Point to the treatment plant. A force main of this size will require soil cover over it at, of at least two, uh, two meters deep. The excavation on less short will require to be at least 3.5 meters deep by about 12 meters wide of the surface. WorkSafe BC has stringent requirements for the protection of workers and excavations of this type. Dallas Road and the other streets involved are narrow and are already encumbered with other utilities such as water mains, sewers, drains, communication cables, hydro poles, sidewalks, and construction of this main must inevitably involve disruption of pedestrian and vehicle, vehicle, vehicle traffic. The amenities of Beacon Hill Park can also be expected to be impacted by an excavation as intrusive as this. Further, it's not at all clear that a satisfactory pipeline route can be found across the Ogden Point cruise ship terminal to the portal shaft and tunnel entrance. Rock outcrops at numerous points in this route, extensive blasting would be required. The tunnel is proposed to be of the utility or type extending from the portal shaft at Ogden Point to the Rockland Point, three meters in diameter, driven through the rock in the bottom of the harbor. The 1200 mm force main would be enclosed within the tunnel. The portal and exit shaft would be six meters in diameter, 25 meters deep, sunk at both ends to provide access to the tunnel. The passage alone of pipeline sections, 1200 mm in diameter, down shaft six meters in diameter, and into and along the tunnel where they would be joined would be difficult and risky in the extreme. Beyond the issues of community disruption of all of this work, uh, I'm sorry, beyond the issues of community disruption, all of this work will be proved to be very expensive. And no reference has been seen by me to date to the geological fault line, fault line which passes nearby. My second concern is similar. It relates to the installation of the two, two 200 mm pipes from a doctrine point to allow the sewage sludge to be pumped to the heart and both solid waste facility and the effluent vents return. These mains would be 17.7 meters in length. They follow a sinuous route from Victoria View Road along other streets to the Heartland Road solid waste facility. My same previous criticisms of community disruption and risk would also apply, also apply here. Sewage sludge is a highly concentrated version of the contaminants that are born in the raw sewage from which it is derived, and it is a noxious substance. The route of the pipeline runs through several neighborhoods ranging from urban to suburban and along numerous narrow streets. As is the case with Dallas Road, these are already encumbered with other municipal utilities and the construction here would lead to the same community disruption and excessive costs. Blasting also is certain with attendant risks 
to the adjoining properties of cracking of foundations and plaster. All new mains would be under pressure for the entire length, and an overflow from a pumping station or a rupture of a main would contaminate both water and land, which would be costly to remediate. All this disruption and expense is proposed to be endured and incurred for the purpose of eliminating, in part, but not in whole, the discharge of screened effluent to the marine waters of the strait. In my view, this is a waste of public resources, and I'd like uh, to urge you to support the passage of the Norman Desjardins motion. Thank you for listening. this opportunity to address you, Madam Chair, and the directors. I, I took the liberty of throwing away my speech about 20 minutes ago, because I believe by now you've heard everything you're ever going to hear and more than you want to hear about this particular important subject matter. Uh, I'm going to address it from a completely different view. You heard a couple people articulate that view today, but no one expanded on it. Uh, I moved to Victoria almost 40 years ago, even in spite of my accent. I still live here, this is my city, I love it. I love Canada, and I think Victoria has more to offer than any city in North America. We are pristine, we're beautiful, and I want to keep it that way. I'm very conflicted to be here today because I've never taken a stance in my 40 years living here on any side to the porch, the report I have now taken on this particular stance. It's difficult when you cross over a side and you know you're going to face people like you and come up with a different decision. You have a very difficult decision to make, a very hard decision to make. The optics of having the sewage treatment plant built or not built is not in any way, in any way, creating a hazard towards tourism coming to Victoria. That's poppycock. There isn't a shred of evidence that supports that people will not come here because the sewage treatment plant is or is not here in Victoria. What we are doing is pristine. We are like, in my mind, the devil and the deep blue sea. If you think of sewage treatment, then think of yourself as the devil. If you think of the deep blue sea, then think of nature's way of treating with the problem that we have treated for all these years and can treat for many years to come. The optics is what's driving this and has driven it to this table today. And optics are a very difficult thing to deal with. Sometimes optics have nothing to do with reality and truth. The truth is that when you travel, and think about it yourselves, has any one of you ever said, I'm not going to go to India, I'm not going to go to China, I'm not going to go to San Diego because they don't treat their sewage? I don't think so. We don't put that on top of our list, but probably not even on the bottom of our list. We go there because we believe what we want to see is the culture and the nature of the people we're visiting. What we're doing is correct. What we're doing is right. I represent many other restaurants here in Victoria. I'm the president of the Culinary Tourism Society of BC. We rely heavily on tourism as why we are driving our particular product. If we in any way thought that by doing what we're doing is wrong, we would not stand here today. Please support the motion. I beseech you, I respect you, but please put aside your personal views and vote for what is right. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> 